This is Richard Nikolai once again, uh, freetheanimal.com, my blog. And from time to time, I interview uh, interesting people. And this is a real special one today. I'm with uh, Nick <coughs> Stephauser, and uh, I believe you're in Michigan. Yes, sir. Right, Michigan. Okay. Now, <laughs> this young man is, uh, is in... I'm going to try to do this without being uh, the slightest bit condescending, but it is it is the big elephant in the room. Once you get once we get into what we're talking about, um, Nick is 20 years old, and he's a filmmaker, and he already has a, a feature length uh, documentary sort of a film out with production quality that is I find astounding. It could play in any theater. It really could. Uh, so without uh, um, uh, much more jabbering about that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick. And Nick, um, uh, tell me about uh, what, you know, give us your uh, short life story. <laughs> and, um, and tell us uh, what got you into uh, filmmaking and um, some of the stuff you've done along the way. Go ahead. Sure. Well, um, actually, this is something that you and I haven't talked about yet. I'm actually a magician too. I always have a deck of cards in my hands. Uh, and I've been a magician for as long as I've been a filmmaker. And to me, they're the same thing. Magic and film to me are, are identical. You know, you have presentation, you have um, misdirection, you have uh, a storyline. And so I've been interested in film and magic for roughly about 12 years now, ever since I was seven or eight years old. And I've been making, you know, short, crappy films on Windows Movie Maker and with point and shoot cameras uh, since I was young. And uh, I, I cultivated the passion for film as I became more and more of a professional magician and uh, I chose not to go to college. Uh, I, the university scene was not for me. I did not feel like I would thrive there. And so I went to a trade school for film uh, here in Troy. It was a 13 month program. And about halfway through, uh, I was the first um, student to have ever uh, produced a film that was good enough to make it into film festivals and then start winning film festivals. And so I uh, produced a short film called Goner and um, won a handful of awards from different festivals around there and really started to gain notoriety just in the very small film community here in Michigan. And... Uh, I had been kind of loosely involved in the political world. Uh, I tried to keep my political views to myself, being in a, a very left-leaning uh, art school. I did not want to let anyone know that I voted for Trump. I just wanted to keep my head down and make movies. And I was invited by Miley Yiannopoulos um, through a mutual friend of ours to go to Berkeley and finish his Dangerous Faggot tour out when he was doing the, uh, the Berkeley, or I'm sorry, the Breitbart tour. Um, I had met him when he came to MSU. We struck up that, a conversation. Uh, just one quick uh, uh, precision yeah. here. That to uh, Berkeley, that's the one that got shut down with the Antifa yeah. violence. Isn't that, isn't that correct? Kind of rioting. Yeah. And yeah. you were there. And you were there and you, you have footage in your movie. Exactly. But we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay. For sure. Yeah. So um, I, I met Milo at MSU. We struck up a conversation and he thought that um, I was somebody worth paying attention to. Now, as you and I kind of uh, alluded to the first conversation, um, it was nothing romantic. It was purely intellectual. For those who know Milo, he's obviously extraordinarily homosexual. Yeah, we, um, we covered that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he invited myself and, and a friend of mine out to Berkeley to finish off his tour. And um, so we went to a few different schools, Cal Poly being one of them, and it culminated in UC Berkeley. And so uh, it was myself, my friend, his entire crew, a bunch of Navy SEALs, and Milo. We were all getting ready at MLK building on Sproul Plaza at UC Berkeley. And there's about a thousand protesters outside, just students and teachers. Um, and I was filming with my T3I, just getting some footage. I had no idea I was gonna be making this documentary. 
and things started to heat up outside. And eventually you see this black blocked militia looking troop start marching through the gateway of Sproul Plaza toward MLK building. And you can only see their eyes. They're completely wearing black. They have armor and gear and everything. And they start setting off explosives. They're shooting Roman candles into the glass underneath. They ripped apart the steel barricade and smashed it through the, the glass of the building right underneath us. So I was one level above filming them um, with my camera. They were throwing rocks and M80s up at me. And uh, so we had to be evacuated out the back of the building. And it was that night that, you know, my heart rate was slowly returning to normal in the hotel when I thought, okay, maybe, maybe this is something you should make a film about. Maybe you could tell the story of what's happening to America. And, and that was about a year and nine months ago, um, which is when I really started to piece together this film. Wow. And okay, so uh, let me let's do it this way. So, so of, of course you have footage uh, from that. You have you have a significant amount of uh, basic, I guess you call it file footage, that you can you know search around and find and clip into the film. But but the biggest part of it is kind of this discussion you've created by. And I think you told me that you flew to 13 separate locations to actually film people in person. Um, who, who, so run us down the list of who you interviewed in this film. Yeah, so uh, probably the most notable, who's actually somebody who leans very, very far left, would be Chenki Weir of the Young Turks Network. Um, we have Gavin McInnes of Get Off My Lawn and CRTV. Cassie J, the director of the Red Pill documentary, Sabo, the Los Angeles-based political street artist, Kyle Chapman, AKA based stick man. Uh, we have Sergeant Ray Kelly, who's the Alameda County Sheriff's uh, Office press interaction officer. Uh, we have uh, Martina Marcota, who is uh, also known as Lady Alchemy. She's a burlesque performer from New York. Or who, uh, I know there's a few more that I'm missing. We have a lot of a kind of on the ground interviewees. Uh, uh -huh. My hometown here in Detroit, I just went out with my camera and pulled truly like the first four people off the street that I could and just interviewed them. Um, it, yeah. um, okay, so now let's jump back a little bit and tell us about, because it's interesting, tell us about the whole uh, production process. It took you basically a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And so run us through what the pro, how, how, what's the first thing you, you, well, the first thing you did was you had footage you can use uh, from the, from the Berkeley incident. And so then you have to build kind of a story around that. And so w then, then where do you go from there? How do you get to where you have this final deal? It was really, uh, it was really an educational process for me, a discovery process. Um, so when you are trained in filmmaking, in the filmmaking world, to construct a narrative film, right, in Hollywood, you have a script, you have producers, you have a budget, you have an assistant director who breaks down the script. I had none of that. I did not have a script. I was writing it as I was learning about this. So. I mean, I was, I was raised in the traditionally conservative household, but I, that was just very superficial. Republicans are good, Democrats are bad. You know, they, there was not a lot of the nitty gritty like political philosophy. So um, as I began to interview these people, I actually became educated um, so much more deeply on um, the philosophical roots, the, the political philosophy of, you know, neo-Marxism and socialism and, and the communist revolution and where Antifa came from and what the weather underground is and, um, you know, what it means to have the difference between personal sovereignty and totalitarianism and just all of these things, I became enlightened about them. And so uh, Lee Stranahan was a, a great interviewer, that, or interviewee, and 
talking with him just in like the hour that I, I talked to him when I went to DC, uh, I kind of got a blueprint for like, okay, this is where the film's going. This is how you take the audience through from uh, San Bernardino, the problem, to- That's the, the, that's the backdrop, the, uh, the, the two Muslims uh, who shot uh, of like some sort of, I forget what sort of center it was. It was a government building. Uh, yeah, I, it, was for, it was a developmental center for people with uh, developmental disabilities. So you had like autistic people and they sh went in and shot their coworkers. Um, and, and so I was trying to, to answer the question, why were the neighbors of those terrorists afraid to uh, voice their fears and suspicions? That's really the jumping off point. Why were the neighbors of these two Islamic terrorists too afraid uh, of being called Islamophobes or racists to say, hey, my neighbors are acting very suspiciously. I don't feel comfortable. Maybe you should take a look in. And, and, thus, and thus the title of the film, How to Kill 14 People Without Saying a Word. Yes, exactly. And so that's what I set out to, uh, to answer. The original name of the film was actually called Unspeakables. The cost of silence and uh, I was talking to uh, a producer friend of mine and she said uh, that sounds like homework you can't you can't call it that that sounds boring you have to come up with something more exciting and mm -hmm. when I uh, when I realized that San Bernardino was going to be the origin story or the the spine of this film um, that's where the the new title developed and that's really I think if you watch the film it's kind of this macabre how-to guide where I have a step-by-step -step process of like if you want to cause the deaths of lots of people here's the steps that you follow so so what you so what you initially see is this violence at Berkeley designed to uh, shut Milo up so that he doesn't even get a chance to discuss. And of course, we've all seen the videos of him over the years at, when he d did his uh, tour at, uh, you know, when he spoke at, at a number of college campuses and people just stand up and they try to shut him down. It's intimidation. Um, but, and that's verbal intimidation, but it is, it is, it, it is escalated now to the point where uh, people are, you know, throwing um, uh, rockets and, and, you know, homemade explosives and, um, and destroying property and so on. And so then we see in San Bernardino, these 14 murders take place and people knew or suspected that these folks could be a problem, but did not say anything because they see the intimidation out there and they'll be called an Islamophobe or a racist or, you know, any of the other uh, labels that get tossed around. Is that, is that correct uh, about your film? Yeah, that, that's exactly it. But I, I take it even deeper than that because I see suppression of speech is actually the superficial symptom of the real problem. And the real problem is a cosmic war between traditional American values, between Western values on one side and a communist Marxist revolution on the other. This is what we're fighting. And the first strike, the first nuclear uh, weapon loosed by the leftists is always and has always been the suppression of free expression in every single situation. Uh, and you see this all all throughout the 20th century. When Very you, good. When somebody is no longer allowed to express um, their thoughts or to conflict the narrative that the left is putting out, that is the beginning of totalitarianism. Great. All right, now, so um, we've, we've given the list of these people and you flew around and interviewed them. That's a big, uh, that's a big undertaking, a big uh, financial investment as well. Uh, um, and I don't want to get into your, your actual finances here, but um, you, if, when you got done, when, when everything was, you know, in the can, so to speak, how much total footage did you have that, to edit down to one hour? Oh, it's about an hour and eight minutes, I guess. Yeah, I had about 
750 gigs of footage, which was maybe like 15 hours, maybe 16 hours. 16. Trim down to uh, originally, I think it was about 90 minutes. And when I was working with uh, a collaborator, on I would I would edit, and then I sent him the cut, and he would say, "This is good. This is bad. This needs work." Um, and he agreed. He's like, "Yeah, this could be this could be shorter." And so I think I struck on a good good length of the film that really is is dense enough to keep your interest, but is also brief enough to make you feel like whoa okay i just got like a ton of a ton of content in a short period of time i had i had to watch it twice because the first time through i was so um taken you know with all these elements we've talked about your 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 age and you know most people are start are you know getting some apprentice job by the time they're 20 years old uh you know somewhere um, and before they actually break into doing it, and you just went, you just, uh, you just, you, you cut in line and just went, <laughs> went, went right for it. Um, so that's, but I can't imagine, you know, 15 hours down into one and what you did. And I'm telling everyone here, um, that it's very interesting. And this is from my perspective, someone who's watched it twice, um, so there's the message that we've talked about the message, but then with all these people interviewed and, and it's all, it's, he does it in such a clever way that it's as though they're having a conversation, like they're sitting in a town hall meeting and having a discussion, a conversation about the need for free expression, um, that we can't be intimidated and, um, and whatnot. And, and actually, you'll have a hard time if you don't know who some of these, like the guy, the Young Turks guy. I mean, he's as left as, as they come. But it doesn't come out that way. And he's probably, he's probably talking about the awful things people, conservatives and people on the right say. But the way it's cut and edited, it's, 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 um, it is, uh, it's uh, non political specific i suppose with you know people throw around the non-gender specific so it's non-political specific which is a good thing i mean we're, we're all familiar with the the shout down shows right and it's not that you can actually listen to it right it's it's kind of like the 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 the, the full length piece and one reason uh, i i i listen to npr in the car for example, is because they they have these um, full pieces that's back and forth, where at least you can understand what everybody is saying, even though it's left slanted, right? You can still sometimes get a, a some pretty decent information out of it, and this is even better. It's not I would. It's not right slanted or left slanted, I don't think. That's not what I get out of it. What it is, is it's the Ameri it's, it's slanted to the traditional American value of politically speaking your mind and not being uh, intimidated or shouted down or worse, uh, have violence used against you to shut you down. And um, so it's, it's, it's really a discussion about having more open discourse uh is that fair nick yeah it, that's exactly what it is and it, i what i hope to have conveyed to is sort of where this comes from as well you know there's a, a decent section in there about the weather underground and where um, our universities have become transformed and why they have become these local excuse me these locales of marxism and marxist ideology I just saw a headline today about how uh, Marx is the number one most assigned economist. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's have a laugh. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a, it's a a dismal nihilistic tragic yeah. laugh. Not not Milton Friedman, for example, no, or, Karl or, Marx, or 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 uh, um, you know any of the others that we Henry Hazlitt and and uh, all of those guys. Okay, so um, now let's, let's talk about, um, let's talk about how 
So I'm going to have the links up and you can shoot me anything else. If you have links that you want me to include in the post for your, uh, for some of your past uh, uh, projects or whatnot for, for folks. But now it's on Vimeo pro now you, so I, but that's his account. You can just go watch it on video on Vimeo and you can buy, you can purchase the, the film for, I think ten dollars nine ninety nine or something like that. Or he has just um, um, set up rental option. So you can yeah. rent it for half that four ninety nine. And I think the, once you rent it, you've got it for like 30 days. You can watch it as many times as you want. Okay. And, and he told me that he's, he just put up this option because we talked about it the other day. And um, so he, he, this would be a good chance for him to gather uh, data because uh, he already knows what his current, you know, runs are uh, in, you know, run rate in terms of, of uh, purchases. And so he's, he's told me he's going to leave it up for at least two weeks to rent. And then, and, and then you'll have 30 days in which to uh, in which to watch it as many times as you like, and um, and if it works, if this rental option works out, then he'll likely keep it up there, and so uh, you'll be able to uh, tell friends and family, hey, you got to watch this thing, right? It's only it's it's same same thing like you go in and rent a, a and it's the the quality is astounding, right? And that's why he went out. He didn't do interviews like we're doing here. Uh, you know, you, he went out and, you know, hauled camera and sound and lighting equipment uh, in order to do these in a, in a highly professional way. You'll, you'll, and, and then all of the graphic stuff he uses and, and all of that is just uh, fabulous. Uh, Nick, is, is there anything else that you would like to say about uh, your film? I think just the, the highlight that you touched on already is that this is not a right or a left wing film. This is a, a philosophical discussion. This is a, an analysis of where we are in America. And it's really a warning because I think you and I have our finger on the pulse of this right now. And we're seeing this, this escalation to a point where I think something might happen that breaks the camel's back and we start seeing blood in the streets. Yes, well, civil war. And in fact, uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure who said it, but one of your interviewees talked about, you know, there's all this talk about revolution. It's like, you don't want to pick this fight. You know, uh, um, there, is, uh, there, are, there are about 400 million guns in America in the hands of roughly 100 million people, all of them all of them Second Amendment supporters, and then you add to that billions of rounds of ammunition, and you add to that that, in general, uh, the police forces and the U.S. military are pro Second Amendment and and tilt far to the more conservative side. So I would I would echo that sentiment. It's not a fight you want to to uh, pick at all. No, it's, it's, this is not like. This is not like the sort of civil war stuff you see in every other country where they don't have guns. The, 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 the Americans are the militia. Uh, and I've said for a long time that the Second Amendment is the Constitution. Everything else is just, it's whatever it is, but the Second Amendment is the Constitution. And that's a, Kurt, that's a quote from uh, Kurt Doolittle, who I've interviewed uh, in this medium twice. Okay, so... Um, I think we'll uh, wrap it up there. Go rent or buy uh, the video. Of course, if you buy it when friends and family are over, you know, it gives you an opportunity for in perpetuity to say, hey, you got to sit down and watch this thing, right? And, um, and so uh, uh, I'm really, it's really a great thing, Nick. I got to tell you, when, you know, when, you, when, we, when we got connected via, you know, my, my stuff on, on Facebook, I, um, I think it was uh, actually my Keto Tard Chronicles uh, Facebook group, and you put a comment there, and you, I guess you went head down, face first into my blog for like hours and hours. Yeah, I did. I just lost myself in Free the Animal, and I was like, man, this guy, he and I agree on so much, and, and we're speaking the same language. I think he'd really enjoy the film, so I just sent it to you. Yeah. Yep. And that's where it got started. I, and I'm like reading, I had to do it. I had to read it like two or three times because I watched it. I said, okay. And I go in and watch the trailer and everything. And then I come back to your email and I'm reading, it, I'm like, 
did he say he started when he was 20 or he is 20? <laughs> so I couldn't, I was like, oh, I got to tell this story. So this is, this has been great. And I really uh, thank you for coming on board, uh, Nick, and uh, we'll do it again sometime. And I will get a blog post up within a few days so that we can promote this uh, for you and uh, get the word out because it's a word that we want to get out. And it's very, very, um, it really has the pulse, I think, of what's going on right now. So I encourage everyone to, uh, to grab that and watch it. All right, Nick, thanks for being with me. Thanks so much for having me, Richard.